All right, let's talk about the um, uh, 30 Years' War. I'm first going to actually tell you what the outcome is of the 30 Years' War. Then I'll explain it a little bit in detail. So here's the biggest thing you need to take out of the 30 Years' War. There was the Reformation, which Martin Luther started. Then there was the, which broke up the church. Basically, that meant that you, people could now, especially in the Holy Roman Empire, which was, you know, the biggest empire in Europe for a long time, and had a bunch of individual principalities or little regions. Uh, after Martin Luther had his Reformation, the printing press spread his word. Basically, princes could make their kingdoms independent, and they didn't have to follow the Catholic Church anymore. The Catholic Church responded with the Catholic Reformation, which we talked about, and there was the Inquisition and everything. So this led to a lot of conflict and fighting. This was a very religious wars, Catholics versus Protestants. Um, basically, it ends with the Peace of Westphalia, the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, which is a series of separate treaties which ends the war, which pretty much says, all right, everybody back in your corner. We're going to have different religions in Europe just the way it's going to go. We're going to have the Protestant churches, some which are Lutheranism from Martin Luther, Calvinism, a man named John Calvin in, um, uh, began in Switzerland, which is another branch of Protestantism. Other Protestant faiths will be able to go, like in England, and kind of everybody back in your corner, we're all going to have our own religions, and they start forming the modern map of Europe with different Christian religions. That becomes the biggest thing. It also grants certain liberties to people. It weakens some kingdoms. And other kingdoms, it actually um, uh, makes the um, uh, king stronger. Now it sounds kind of like a con contradiction. So um, uh, it caused Europeans to become more disillusioned with the establishment religions on both sides. Um, State-sponsored religion declines as states allow greater religious freedoms. The influence of the church also declines. Um, and this led to individuality, even skepticism, and will help start the Enlightenment, which we'll begin as we'll talk about shortly. Um, the war also impacted views of government. Uh, for centuries, Europeans had espoused the concept of there was a divine right of kings, which meant monarchs were put in power by the will of God and were not subject to any other power. But the war shook the faith in government, and people started questioning their government and questioning the kings. Some kings will come down harder and will try to take more authority, and in some places the kings will actually lose their authority, as we will see. So um, uh, that is uh, basically the end result of the Thirty Years' War. Now let me give you some dates, countries, and other important information like that. So the Thirty Years' War lasted 30 years, 1618 to 1648. And again, religion was the central theme. Um, so, when <clears throat> the Catholic Ferdinand II came to the power of crown prince of the Kingdom of Bohemia, this was a large independent kingdom within the Holy Roman Empire, there are many of them. Protestants feared their religious rights would be jeopardized because there were Protestants living there. So it's kind of like when your local king or prince took power, you were supposed to follow that faith. The Protestants didn't want to follow this, cat this king who was Catholic. So they rebelled and they sought support from other leading Protestant states like England, the Dutch Republic, Denmark, Sweden, and others. In 1619, when Ferdinand became the Holy Roman Empire of like the whole, again, big thing, which is shrinking, um, he formed alliances with other Catholic states, including Spain and Hungary. Then they fought it out. Treaty of Westphalia happened, and they're kind of like, all right, everybody, back to your corner, go back to your land and you will be able to work out your religious differences, and we're going to need to have some kind of tolerance. The Reformation's happened. It's not going anywhere. We're going to have Catholic uh, churches, Protestant churches. Different countries are going to have different sects of Christianity. All right, so now that, that big religious uh, conflict is done, let's move to our next big bloody religious conflict, which is um, uh, the English Civil War, which will lead to the Glorious Revolution. So, Henry VIII, who we talked about, had a daughter, uh, Elizabeth I in England, who was a much, much better, was a, a brilliant ruler and did a wonderful job of ruling the country, established the Anglican Church. However, Elizabeth I is called the Virgin Queen because she didn't have any heirs, so it was assumed she was a virgin. 
We'll just assume that, okay? All right, so Elizabeth I never married, so she had no heirs to the throne. And part of the reason why she never married was because no female queen had ever successfully become queen. Kings always took the job. So Elizabeth I never got married, never had to have a king try to over, you know, overrule her. Again, she was a badass. So she never marries, and therefore she has no heirs. So what happens is the power is transferred to her relatives who live in Scotland, and they're called the Stuarts. So um, uh, what happens is James I comes in, it's kind of like her, I, think I believe that would be her nephew, comes in and he takes power. And his quote for this is, I will not be content that my power will be disputed upon by anyone. So this is what he told to Parliament. Parliament at this time is kind of like a group of advisors to uh, the king. They kind of suggest things, but they can't really do very much. So James pursues a lavish lifestyle and wages many wars. Um, he Parliament demands that they be consulted and said, hey, you should be telling us about this. And he says, bye-bye, Parliament, dissolves them and gets rid of Parliament and says, I am in charge. Which, again, Parliament does not like very much. Parliament believes this is um, uh, going against what is called the Magna Carta, which was written back in 1215, which basically made Parliament exist. So um, uh, James rules, and he's able to get away with this dissolving of Parliament, James I. Charles I. He inherits the throne from James I. So the first to the first, James to the... Charles I. Charles I inherits the throne in 1625, and he's just like his dad. He um, uh, Basically, Parliament is allowed to come back, but uh, G Charles I wants Parliament, you know, basically off to the side. Um, so, uh, Parliament asks that he sign a petition of rights which prohibits the king from raising taxes. Charles signs it, but then he dissolves Parliament and gets rid of them 11 months later. I mean, months later. For 11 years, he rules with no parliament there at all. Uh, Charles I tries to impose the Anglican Prayer Book. This is the Church of England, the Anglican Prayer Book on Scotland in 1637. And at this time, many Scots are not Anglican, they are Calvinist. Calvinist starts in Switzerland, a religion, and it gets exported through a man named John Knox to Scotland. This guy, John Knox, goes from Switzerland, brings this uh, uh, Protestant faith Calvinism there, and many Scots practice it. Anglican was a different Protestant faith. Um, so he brings the Church of England. So he brings this prayer book there, and the Scots do not like it, and they revolt. Um, so um, to do that, the king needs to raise large funds, but uh-oh, he said that, he needs Parliament to raise taxes, so he needs to raise these taxes, and Parliament are a lot of powerful people who know how to get money, so he's got to bring Parliament back in to get the taxes. When Parliament meets in 1640, they're like, we're not just going to raise taxes and be dissolved again. So they launch their own revolt. So Parliament's revolting, the Scots are revolting, there's a whole lot of revolting going on. And this will bring us to the English Civil War, the English Civil War, the Civil War in England which lasts between 1642 and 1649. The Cavaliers, or supporters of Charles, seemed to have a winning advantage because they had a trained army, weapons, and the king. However, the Roundheads, who were the people in Parliament, they were called that because they had close-cut hair. They didn't wear, like, long hair. Part of the reason for that is because they didn't want to look like the kings who had very long hair. Anyway, um, so Oliver Cromwell is their leader, and he organizes the New Model Army. I know. Anyway, so he organizes the New Model Army, and by 1647, the king was in hands of parliamentary forces. Charles I, the king, and parliament now has him captured, and they try him and find him guilty of being a traitor, a tyrant, a murderer, and a public enemy. So what do they do with him? They take his long-haired head and they behead him. Charles, when he's on kneeling down to get his head chopped off, actually um, uh, on the agreed, he wanted to be the one to give the signal to have his head chopped off. So he wanted to have authority in that. Again, he's a king. So in England, no other ruler could claim absolute power and ignore the law ever again because the precedent's been set that if you ignore parliament, parliament may take you and cut off your head. Most people don't want to lose their heads. So the House of Commons abolishes the monarchy. There's no more monarchy. And they declare a republic. 
known as the Commonwealth, with Oliver Cromwell as their new leader. So all is going to work out well. <clears throat> we'll see. So anyway, Ch Cromwell showed no religious tolerance towards Catholics at all. Um, with supporters, uh, when supporters of Charles I's son, Charles II, launched an attack from Ireland and Scotland, Cromwell leads forces into Ireland, crushing the uprising. And once he gets there, he goes too far, and he represses the Irish Catholic majority. In 1652, he passes a law exiling most Catholics to barren land in the west of Ireland. Anyone found disobeying is killed on sight. Also in England, uh, open Catholic worship was banned. Other forms of Protestant faith, however, were accepted. So you could be a Protestant, but you couldn't be a Catholic. And on the plus side, he welcomes the Jewish people back in after 350 years of being kicked out of England. But, so you can be Protestant, you can be Jewish, but Catholics they're against because they're afraid that a Catholic king will come back in. Uh, all right, so... Um, Oliver takes the title, Oliver Cromwell takes the title of Lord Protector, not King, Lord Protector, in 1653. And from there he rules the army, and he uses the army to terrorize people throughout the country who don't follow his laws. Uh, for example, again, to go against the Catholic Church, the, the insides of the Catholic Churches are destroyed to save England. But he's very much a Protestant, a, a Puritan, and he is a Christian. Sunday gets set aside for religious observances. Any kind of profaning the Lord's Day is fined, including any persons in a tavern, it's a bar, tobacco house, cellar, even dancing or uh, profanely singing is against the law. So positive side, however, is that the social reforms um, make that everyone is taught how to read. There becomes more school, even for girls, because they want people to be able to read the Bible. So though the Puritans seem cold and strict, they um, uh, try to promote the idea of love. Uh, to increase um, uh, fidelity in marriage, they encourage people to marry. They encourage people to marry out of love instead of economic interest. However, women are still seen as subordinate or underneath men. Cromwell is the dominant figure, the Lord Protector, but when he dies in 1658, the Puritans lose their grip on England. People are tired of a repressed lifestyle that is given to them. So when Parliament is elected in 1660, they actually invite the King Charles II to return from exile. And many people welcome this change. Charles II is a popular ruler. He reopens theaters and taverns, which had been closed down. Um, he restores the official Church of England and tolerates other Protestants. Although he still believed in absolute monarchy and had Catholic sympathies, he wanted to keep his head so he didn't bring him back in. His brother James II, though, is different. He inherits the throne in 1658. He shows his Catholic faith, flaunts it, and suspends laws at a whim, tries to rule like an old king, and there's consequences. So because of this, Parliament fears he might restore the Roman Catholic Church. They take action in 1688 by inviting uh, James' Protestant daughter, James II's Protestant daughter, Mary, and her Dutch Protestant husband, William III of Orange, William and Mary, to become rulers of England. And this is called the Glorious Revolution because it's supported by the people, and no one's head was chopped off, no one dies. So William and Mary arrives with their army, and James flees to France. So, William and Mary become the new kings, and they begin a new line, and England becomes a constitutional monarchy, which it still is today. So basically what happens is they, um, uh, they make what is called the English Bill of Rights. Some things included in this that the monarch is required to summon parliament regularly. The House of Commons is given the power of the purse. They decide the taxes and where's money going to be spent, which basically gives them most of the power. The king or queen can no longer interfere in parliamentary debates. King and queen can no longer suspend laws. Catholics were barred from sitting on the throne. Um, England would now be a limited monarchy constitutional monarchy, and the rights of the citizens were, rest were stated. So this basically brings England to its modern government that we see today. Again, so it's a constitutional monarchy, which would spread throughout Europe. Reaction to this is by a lot of the kings in places like France is to become really, really, really strict and try to prevent this from happening in their country, which will, in the case of France, as we study later, also lead to their kings being headless. <clears throat> 